Baruchim Aboyim. Again, thank you very much for attending. Um, welcome to our home. And um, again, this week on my thoughts, I would like to discuss the concept of miracles. You know, I think that miracles are something that at one time or another, we have all thought about. I believe that most of us would say, you know, if God Almighty were to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, well, that would change my life in many ways. Or if we were privy to an amazing miracle, something beyond the realm of possibility, I would think again that such an experience would automatically change our lives. Well, let's look into God's book, the Torah, and let us examine what the results were when people did experience a personal audience with God Almighty or were witness to a supernatural occurrence. Before we begin, let me first uh, define what a miracle is. Wikipedia defines a miracle as a highly unusual event believed to be of a supernatural or a divine origin. It goes on to explain that a miracle is an event that is inexplicable by natural or scientific laws and accordingly gets attributed to some supernatural or preternatural cause. You know, the Torah relates, relates many miracles that occurred to our ancestors. The Torah also relates miracles that God Almighty performed for others well, such as God speaking to Bilaam, the greatest prophet of the nations. All God also appeared to Lavan, Yaakov's father-in-law, in, in addition to Paro, the king of Egypt, and Avimelech, the king of the Plishtim. All received a nocturnal visit from God Almighty. The question that we must ask is, did these nocturnal communications with God Almighty create a positive and long-term effect on the recipients of these dreams or not? In regards to Lavan, Paro, and Avimelech, you know, they all view <clears throat> their encounter with God Almighty as a warning. That being the case, they all reacted according to God's message, such as Lavan, whose original intent was to harm Yaakov and his family. However, after his dream, he refrained from harming them in any way. We also read that both Paro and Avimelech abducted Sarah, our mother, and brought her into their harem. However, after receiving a nocturnal warning from God, they released her with both gifts and an apology. Nowhere in Torah do we find it mentioned that these occurrences changed these men in any permanent fashion. In fact, with love on its states, at the end of the portion of Vayetze, it says, that Lovon went and returned to his place. Our sages interpret these words to indicate that even after his audience with God Almighty, it did not change him in any way. He was still the same Lovon as he was before his nocturnal encounter with God Almighty. Bilaam's reaction was completely different. Somehow, Bilaam thought that he could outsmart God. He believed that in the end he would succeed in doing exactly what he wanted rather than that which God had instructed him to do. God Almighty tried to save Bilaam from himself. God even went so far as to create a miracle to save Bilaam's life. You know, God opened the mouth of Bilaam's donkey and it miraculously it began talking to him. Their conversation was truly over and above the laws of nature. A true miracle. Nonetheless, we witnessed that Bilaam did not change. He still continued to follow his own selfish and greedy path. He was blinded by his selfishness, greed, and his hatred of the Jewish people, the children of Israel. All of these facts dictated his reason and his actions. He ignored all of God Almighty's warnings, which in the end brought about his early demise. I think that most of us would say that if we had a personal experience, if we had personally experienced a miracle that was orchestrated by God Almighty, that we would not be the same person that we were before our revelation. We would hope that it would inspire us to become more righteous and observant individuals. It's an interesting thought, but, but, does, reality, but does the reality of history, what does that teach us? Let us begin our examination with the redemption of the children of Israel from Egypt. No generation, no generation saw more miracles than the generation of Jews who were redeemed from Egypt with Moshe and Aaron. Even before they were redeemed from Egypt, they had witnessed all the plagues that God Almighty brought upon the Egyptians. 
Our sages tell us that the children of Israel witnessed even more miracles at the sea. This is the reason they are referred to as Dor Dea, the generation of knowledge, a title bestowed upon them based on all the many miracles and revelations that they experienced when they were redeemed from Egypt and then crossed the sea. There's a medrash that states that a maidservant who stood at the sea was privy to more revelations than the prophet Yechezkel experienced when he went up to heaven in a fiery chariot. This was in addition to all the miracles that occurred daily during their 40-year journey through the wilderness. You know, after leaving Egypt, they traveled to the Yam Suf, the Red Sea. Miraculously, God Almighty split the sea into 12 separate paths, allowing each of the tribes to walk through the sea on dry land. Yet, at that exact time moment, the children of Israel were walking that children of Israel were walking safely through the dry seabed. The Egyptian army that had followed them into the sea were drowning. The children of Israel had left Egypt with no provisions other than the matzah that they carried on their shoulders. Miraculously, that matzah lasted for 30 days. Then after the 30-day period ended, God Almighty performed another miracle for them. They received spiritual food that fell from heaven, what they called the mun. It continued to fall daily throughout all the 40 years that the children of Israel traveled in the desert. That is with the exception of the Shabbat and the holidays. You know, there were many miracles that accompanied the mun as, as an expression of God Almighty's great love for the children of Israel. He had the mun fall daily. This was done so the mun would always be fresh. In addition, it meant that they were not troubled with transporting large amounts of mun with them as they traveled from one place to another. Another miracle connected to the mun was how it was delivered. If you were a righteous individual, the mun would fall at the door of your tent in the form of a loaf of bread. If you were a middle-of-the-road individual, it would fall at the edge of the camp as raw dough. And if you were an evil individual, the mun would fall outside the camp in the desert in the form of coriander seed. That being the case, the mun also served as a sort of daily report card. Another novelty that was connected to the mun was no matter how much or how little an individual gathered, they would always have the same amount, an omer of mun. In addition, the mun was totally absorbed into their bodies, leaving absolutely no waste product. This too created a miracle in that they felt no need to relieve themselves. As I mentioned, the mun was delivered fresh daily. If one were to keep some of their mun for the next day, well, it would turn wormy and it would stink. However, on Friday, the day before the Shabbat, and on the day before any of the holidays, the people would collect the same amount of mun that they collected daily. However, when they would take it back to their tents, they would realize that the amount of mun that they had collected had miraculously doubled. Not only was the amount doubled, it lasted throughout the whole Shabbat and holiday without becoming wormy or stinky. For the 40 years they traveled in the desert, they were accompanied with the well of Miriam, a virtual sea of water. Our sages tell us then, when, whenever the nation would camp for any period of time, each tribal prince would put a mark in the sand with their staff and the water would be, begin flowing from Miriam's well. The Medris tells us that there was such an, an abundance of water that one needed a boat to travel from one tribe to another. Another major miracle that occurred daily for the nation as they traveled through the desert was the clouds of glory, the Ananea Kabbalah. Altogether, there were seven clouds, four clouds that surrounded them, one on each side of the compass, one cloud that hovered above them, and another that was beneath their feet. The seventh cloud led them by day and gave them heat and light at night. Though they traveled in a barren wilderness, wherever they camped, if you think about it, they were really living on lakefront property. This meant that they were surrounded by all types of plants and greenery. After all, they had water, soil, and a sealed environment. In Kadesh, where they were encamped for 19 years, there were even trees that grew. This was the reason that all the laws of the Torah connected with agriculture did not take effect until the nation entered the land of Canaan. Strangely enough, 
We do read again and again that the people did sin in the desert. In fact, twice, God Almighty thought of destroying them completely. It was only through Moshe's intervention that they were saved from total annihilation. You know, even with all the miracles that they had and were experiencing daily, somehow, they still questioned whether God was in their midst or not. Even during the times of the temples, we read that there were 10 open miracles that occurred daily in the temple. People were actually able to witness firsthand that they were in God's house. The presence of God Almighty was open and evident for all to see. For example, when the nation gathered for the holidays, they stood shoulder to shoulder in the temple courtyard, cramped together like sardines. Yet, when it came time for them to prostrate themselves, somehow everyone had Daladamas, seven feet of space on all sides. Even with all these open and revealed miracles, we find that the children of Israel were still able to sin grievously against God and his Torah. We witness that their sins brought about the destruction of both of his holy temples. But how is that possible? We witness again and again that miracles are not the answer to making a person a true believer and a servant to God. The question that we must ask then is, what is the answer? I think that a miracle is only referred to as a miracle if it is an occurrence that goes against the laws of nature. If something occurs constantly, we would perceive it as natural. This brings up an interesting point. We view the Mun, the Well of Miriam, and the Clouds of Glory as true miracles. Yet they existed throughout the 40 years that the children of Israel traveled in the desert. Imagine if an individual was born in the first year of the Jewish nation's journey in the desert. They would have grown up with Mun falling from heaven daily. For them, natural food growing from the earth huh, would have been perceived as miraculous. The mun that fell daily would have been viewed as natural. The same would have been said about the well of Miriam and the clouds of glory. I believe that we as human beings have a tendency to take our many blessings for granted. Look around you. We are surrounded by miracles daily. You know, some time ago I took a tour of a Ford assembly plant. I watched as robots were used to assemble the cars. Our guide told us that if a robot broke down, it had the capability of fixing itself. Hmm, I was very impressed. But it made me think about our human bodies. Our bodies have the ability to correct many problems that threaten our very existence. If we cut ourselves, somehow the wound heals by itself. If we break a bone, when the break heals, that bone is even stronger than it was originally. Think of childbirth. Do we really appreciate the magnitude of the miracle? Of course, there is always breathing. Huh. Who ever thought that we would look upon it as a true gift? After the COVID pandemic, I think that we all look at the miracle of breathing just a little differently now. You know, I'm not a doctor, but I'm amazed by some of the facts that we know about the human body. For example, there are over 30 trillion, that's trillion, cells in your body. An average adult human may have roughly 20 to 30 trillion red blood cells in his body at any given time. In fact, there are some white blood cells that do not even live for one full day, and yet red blood cells exist for 120 days. I find the number 120 interesting. In Judaism, we connect that number with a blessing for longevity, as we bless a person with the Hebrew words, Ad of the Esrim that you should be blessed to live until the age of 120. Many scientists today still believe in evolution. They also believe in the Big Bang Theory. In an article in the Wall Street Journey dated Friday, December 26, 2014, it stated that today there are more than 200 known parameters necessary for a planet to support life, every one of which must be perfectly met or the whole thing falls apart. In addition, without a massive planet like Jupiter nearby, whose gravitational field draws away asteroids, a thousand times as many asteroids would collide with the Earth's surface than do already. The odds against life in the universe are simply astonishing. With all the evidence to the contrary, there are still many doctors and scientists who are not practicing religious individuals. Many are atheists and even agnostics. 
One would think that with all the knowledge that doctors and scientists share, the wonders of modern science and medicine, that they would be the most religious of all people. Socrates was quoted as saying that a doctor keeps his patient company while God Almighty does his miracles. It would seem that very little has changed. I think that we define a miracle as something out of the ordinary. Look around you. There are so many things that we view as the norm, but are they really normal? I remember hearing people say when I was younger, when they put a man on the moon, then I will do so-and-so. Well, <laughs> today's space travel is the norm, no miracle at all. The world that we live in today is replete with miracles. Wonder drugs, computers, cell phones, the worldwide internet, high-tech vehicles, airplanes, the list goes on and on. Do we thank God Almighty daily for all these miracles or we just take them for granted? Somehow we just think of them as natural. I'm afraid that we've become spoiled children who have taken all of these amazing gifts, breakthroughs in technology for granted. We now see them as the norm, faster and better ways to entertain ourselves. You know, I played racquetball for many years. I found it interesting <clears throat> that if I attempted to place the ball into the left corner, but I mishit the ball and it went into the right corner, I would always thank God since I was, it was totally unexpected. But then I thought to myself, if I'm aiming for the left corner, but the ball goes into the right corner, then I thank God Almighty for winning the point. However, if I, aim, if I am aiming for the left corner and the ball goes into the left corner, then I don't thank God? But why? Whether the ball goes into the right corner or the left corner, they are both the same. In the end, everything is the will of God. So we can learn from the Torah and from life that miracles are not the answer to creating a sincere and everlasting relationship with God Almighty, our Father in Heaven. Again, so what is the answer? I believe that each one of us is created with a spark of divinity. Our mission in life is to connect that part of God that resides within us to the essence of God Almighty that resides outside of us. We need to look around and acknowledge that we are constantly surrounded by godly miracles. I find that the best way for us to connect with God our Father in Heaven is not by examining the present. We must first look into our past. As it states in Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, Rav Shimon stated that the greatest trait that a person can possess is haroa eshanolid, one who considers the consequences of their actions. The Hebrew word nolid is past tense. In essence, Rav Shimon is telling us that the only way for us to know the future is by first looking into our past. You know, I challenge anyone to look into their past, and I can guarantee then when they open their eyes, they will see the hand of God clearly guiding them on their journey through this minefield that we call life. In a sense, God Almighty is playing hide-and-seek with us. He is hiding in this world, and it is our turn to find Him. The trouble is that we often get distracted and forget to look for Him. He then orchestrates scenarios that forces us to look past ourselves. Since we don't have all the answers... Everything that God Almighty does for us is miraculous from the moment we wake up in the morning until the moment we go to sleep at night. Even while we sleep, He stands over us and protects us. Our problem is that we don't perceive it as such. You know, the real miracle in life is that we have a choice as to whether to build our world or to destroy it. If and when we follow His directives, well, we have the ability to build it. And when we follow our own selfish, self-centered desires, we can and will destroy it. In reality, we are constantly surrounded with miracles. We just need to open our eyes and see them as such. As Helen Keller said, worse than being blind is to have no vision. The key to life is to be impressed with the miracles that we experience daily. But even more so, to recognize and be impressed with He who has created all the miracles that make up our daily lives. God Almighty, our loving Father in Heaven. And with that, let us pray to God our Father in Heaven that He brings about the greatest miracle of all with the coming of the Messiah, with an end to all the violence, hatred, war, and sickness in the world. Let us pray for the release of all the hostages, the curing of all those who are injured and sick, 
the comforting of all those who have lost loved ones, and the safe return of all our brave IDF soldiers quickly and in our time. Again, let me thank you for listening, for attending. Again, I, the State of Israel and all Jews need our prayers, donations, whatever you can do. Again, God should bring a quick end to all of this with the coming of the Messiah. Again, I would appreciate if you push uh, like and subscribe and even share. And again, let me thank you again for attending. God bless. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.